Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Zach Jones from Vertical Measures and I'm here with uh, hosting VM's monthly webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is titled The ABCs of Persuasive Copy and will be presented by our guest host Nancy Harhut. Nancy is passionate about the impact of behavioral sciences on marketing and has integrated campaigns for some of the world's biggest brands. She's an online marketing institute top 40 digital strategist, a Hatch top 100 creative influencer, and the winner of multiple international ECHO awards for marketing effectiveness. Uh, before we do get started though, I just want to bring up a few things. Today's webinar will be available for viewing tomorrow and we will send out an email with the link so you can watch the recording and review the slides. Uh, we'll, also be happy, we'll also be happy to answer any questions. So if you look at the webinar interface, you'll see a questions tab. Uh, feel free to ask there anytime during the webinar and then we can uh, address that in the Q&A section after the Nancy's finished her presentation. Uh, I think that's all. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Nancy. All right, well, thank you very much, Zach, and uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the ABCs of Persuasive Copy. So if you write emails, landing pages, ads, web copy, or just about anything that needs to prompt action, you know how critical your copy can be. And this holds true whether you're writing it, whether you're approving it, whether you're testing it. Uh, the words that you choose make a huge difference. As a matter of fact, it turns out that in marketing, as in Scrabble, some words are worth more than others, which means that the ones that you select and the order that you put those words in can make all the difference in terms of how people respond to your copy. Uh, for example, Cornell University ran a study and they went to a school cafeteria and they changed the name of the carrots to x-ray vision carrots and they found that the kids ate twice as many. Gary Henneberg is a marketing consultant and he found that when the Collins Street Bakery renamed their fruitcake Native Texas Pecan Cake, mail order sales increased 60%. And finally, Robert Cialdini reports that when the American Cancer Society added the phrase, even a penny will help, donations went from 28% to 50%. So clearly, words can be very persuasive. And ironically, the reason for this is people don't really think a lot about what they're reading. They don't always consciously weigh the pros and cons and, and make considered decisions. In fact, very often they rely on decision-making shortcuts. What's a decision-making shortcut? It's an automatic, instinctive, reflexive response. Humans have developed these over the millennia as a way to conserve mental energy because we couldn't possibly weigh every bit of information before making a decision or we'd never get around to making any. So instead, we've developed these hardwired behaviors, and we cruise along through life on autopilot, and when we encounter a particular situation, or in, in the per for the purpose of our conversation today, certain words or phrases, we just default to hardwired behaviors, giving them little to no thought. What I'd like to do today is share 26 words or copy constructs that you can use to trigger some of these automatic behaviors. So there'll be 26 of them, literally one for each letter of the alphabet. So let's get started. A is for the authority principle. Ever since we, we were children, we have been taught to recognize and respect authority. So by the time we're adults, it's ingrained in us. And if an authority tells us to do something, we usually do it. If they tell us um, to believe something, we usually believe it. We trust authorities. As a matter of fact, there were a couple of guys, crooks actually, who dressed up as bank guards and they positioned themselves in front of a Wells Fargo ATM and they taped a sign to the ATM that said, the ATM is broken, please give your money to the guards. And then they just stood there as people walked in, read the sign, turned around and handed the money to these guys. They made off with a lot of money. So some of you might be thinking, awesome, this is worth the price of the webinar right here and now. But for those of you who are wondering, you know, is there a legal way to use the authority principle, let's look at a couple of examples. Here we have an ad from L.L. Bean. They're advertising their ski parkas, and they said that they're trusted and tested by the U.S. ski team. So in this context, the U.S. ski team is an authority. When it comes to ski parkas, they're authorities. Or here we have a business-to-business -business example. This is from the Citrix web website, and obviously on their website they say a lot of wonderful things about them, but then they also know that while people will take what a marketer says with a grain of salt, people will put more weight on what someone else says. So they turn to the authorities and they quote Forrester and Gartner. 
So the authority principle can be very powerful. B is for the word because. Social scientists have found that people are more likely to do what you ask them to do if you give them a reason why. People are more likely to do what you, give, what you ask them to do if you give them a reason why. And a wonderful word to serve up that reason why is the word because. As a matter of fact, Ellen Langer from Harvard University found that when we see or hear the word because, we just start to nod like little bobbleheads. That's a bobblehead there. We just start to nod up and down like little bobbleheads without fully processing what comes next. We, we see or hear the word because, and we just assume that whatever comes afterwards is a good, legitimate, logical reason, and we agree. Because is a compliance trigger. So how do we use that in marketing? Well, look at what Weight Watchers did. They said Weight Watchers works because it's not a diet. Hmm, interesting. Or here we have an investment e-newsletter, and they say, why am I getting this? Well, you're receiving this e-newsletter because we thought this information might be beneficial to you. So it's very interesting. It doesn't even have to be this ironclad, uh, bulletproof reason. It just has to be a reason. Why am I sending you this e-newsletter? E because I thought you might like it, because it might be beneficial to you. That word because is a, a magic word, a power word. C is for commitment and consistency. And what social scientists have found is once people make a decision or take a stand, they like to remain consistent with it when future opportunities arise. So what does this mean to marketers? If we can get that first yes, we're much more likely to get a second yes, a third yes, a fourth yes. This is particularly true if our first ask is relatively small. As a matter of fact, a couple of researchers went out through this neighborhood in Los Angeles and they asked people, how do you feel about safe driving? And as you might imagine, people were in favor of safe driving. So then the researchers said, wonderful, we're so glad that you support safe driving. How about putting up a billboard on your front lawn saying that you support safe driving? Well, here people backed off. They didn't want to put up a billboard. They thought, what are my neighbors going to think? What's it going to do to my property value? What's it going to do to my view? So only 17% said yes. However, there was a small subsegment, and in that small subsegment, 76% of the people said yes. So we have to ask ourselves, what was so different about the people in that small subsegment? Well, Three weeks earlier, when researchers had come by and asked these people to put up a small three inch by three inch sign saying they supported safe driving, these people said yes. So when the researchers came back and asked a billboard, this group of people wasn't thinking about the billboard the way everyone else was, which was from kind of square one or ground zero. No, for them, the decision making shortcut just kicked right in. They had said yes before. It was consistent with their previous action. It was consistent with the stand they took, consistent with the way they saw themselves and the values they had. It was much easier for them to say yes automatically. So how do we use this in marketing? Well, look at the subject line here from Semper International. They say, thanks for your ongoing support. Want to help out again? So they remind you right away in the subject line, you've already said yes to us. You've done business with us. You don't need to vet us as if we were a brand new company that you'd never heard of. You already have said yes to us. Just say yes again. And they, they tee that up right in the subject line. Or here we have Ocean Mist Cosmetics, and they're offering a Try Me kit. So you can get a makeup sampler. And they, knew, they do this because they know that anyone who says yes to the Try Me Sampler Kit is much more likely to say yes when they come back and say, now how about making a purchase? How about buying some of our makeup? They get that first small yes, and then they go for the second and the third. They escalate their asks. D is for deals. Deals are very good for marketers because deals can alleviate the pain of paying. Deals can alleviate the pain of paying. As a matter of fact, uh, social scientists have found that there literally is a pain of paying. All right? If you had a hammer and a nail and you were hammering the nail into a board and you missed and you hit your thumb instead, that would hurt. And that would activate a particular part of your brain. That's where the pain would register. Well, it turns out that when you need to reach into your wallet or your purse and hand over your hard-earned money to somebody else, it activates the same part of your brain. The same part of your brain that, that registers physical pain also registers the pain of paying. So the pain of paying is not such a good thing. You want to minimize it as a marketer. So in your copy, try to avoid or at least minimize your use of words like price, cost, pay, spend. These words signal to the brain that you're going to have to part with money and that's painful. So instead, maybe try phrasing like, for only $10, you gain your know, product name. But try to minimize your use of these words because they remind people they're going to have to pay and that hurts. The other thing that can trigger the pain of paying is coupon codes. And as marketers, we like coupon codes because coupons and cent purchases and the codes allow us to track and tracking is a good thing. 
However, PayPal found that a full 27% of page abandonment comes from coupon codes. People see the coupon code and they think, oh, wait a minute, I'm not going to pay full price. There's a deal to be had. Let me see if I can find it. And they start to Google and they try to find what that coupon code is. And what happens? Instead, perhaps they find a competitor that they like better, or maybe they just get lost and never make their way back to your page. So coupon codes can be tricky. What you want to do with them is, is up to you. I've seen some studies that indicate that you can uh, actually increase sales by as much as 34% by eliminating the coupon codes, but of course then we lose our tracking. What you might want to consider is asking for that code further down. As you can see in this example, the first question is how many do you want? The very next thing is what's your coupon code? So they're asking very early here. If they moved it further down after you've been filling out information, essentially saying yes, 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 you might be more likely to just not go looking for it. The other thing you might want to consider is to rename your coupon code. Maybe it's a VIP code. Maybe it's a, a special promo number. Something so that people who have it will recognize what it's supposed to be, but somebody else won't be prompted to abandon the purchase and go looking for this code out there. E is for eye magnet words. Eye magnet words are words that have the ability to attract the eye like a magnet. When you think about it, when we write, we write in a very linear fashion. One word followed by the next, followed by the next. But that is not how people read. When people read, they skim and they scan. And certain words literally have the power to leap out, pull the human eye in, and get people to more fully consume the content around it. How do we know this? Well, there's been a lot of testing done. There has been in-market testing, eye tracking studies, heat mapping studies. They even put people into fMRI machines flash different words in front of their faces and look to see what parts of their brains light up. And all of these tests from the, the simple in-market AB splits all the way to the fMRI machines, all of these tests indicate that some words have the power to attract the human eye. Those are the words, of course, that you want to use most in your marketing. So what are they? Well, according to Robert Levine, who's the author of The Power of Persuasion, the words easy, quick, and improved have all individually lifted product sales in the market easy, quick, and improved, not necessarily used in combination with each other, but each individually have lifted product sales in market. The word secret is also a really powerful word. In fact, World Data found that if you use the word secret in your email subject line, you can expect an 11% lift in your opening rate. The reason secret is so powerful is social scientists have found that people are more persuaded by information they believe is not readily available. We're more persuaded by information that we think isn't readily or widely available. Secret certainly conveys that idea, but so do phrases like confessions of, a sneak peek, an inside look, a behind the scenes look, the real story of, the truth behind. Any of those convey the idea that you have information that's not widely available, and that makes people act. F is for the word framing. What social scientists have found is the words that you use and, and the, the way that you choose to describe your, your product or your service or your offer can make a big difference in terms of how people respond to it. How you serve it up, how you describe it, how you position it, how you frame it can make a big difference. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a psychologist named Elizabeth Loftus and she ran a very interesting experiment. She showed people a video of a car accident. Everyone watched the video, and then she divided them into two different groups. And she asked one group to estimate how fast the cars were going when they crashed. And the other group was asked to estimate how fast the cars were going when they contacted. The people who were asked how fast the cars were going when they crashed estimated 40.8 miles per hour versus 31.8 miles per hour when the verb contacted was used. That's over a 28% difference. Remember, everyone saw the same video. Everyone was asked the same question. The only difference was the verb, how the question was framed. As a matter of fact, the Journal of Consumer Research did some, uh, published some interesting studies regarding shipping fees. Uh, shipping fees are not wonderful, but sometimes we in marketing have to use them. And so you could either serve it up as a $5 fee or as a small $5 fee. And when it was framed as a small $5 fee, they got a 20% lift. 20% lift just by adding that, that word small. $5 is $5, but a $5 fee versus a small $5 fee, framing it as small made the difference. Button copy can be incredibly powerful when you frame it the right way. And the reason for this is human beings don't really like to say no. We don't really like to say no. So if you have one button, we either click it or we don't. And if we don't click it, that's a passive way of saying no, but we're not actively saying no. But if on your landing page or your uh, interstitial 
you have two buttons, a yes and a no, it, it forces people to take a more active uh, action. But beyond that, the copy that you use on your no button frames the consequence of not saying yes. So here we have yes, get the free case study versus no, I'd rather not know how my marketing is performing. It's like, oh my gosh, when you put it that way. So the copy on the no button really helps to frame the consequences of not saying yes. And as a matter of fact, according to New Neuromarketing out of the Netherlands, you can expect anywhere between a 40 and a 125% lift in conversion by using yes, no buttons. G is for the word guarantee. And guarantees are wonderful because they remove risk. And when risk is removed, people are more likely to act. What, one of the things that keeps people from acting is their, their fear, their risk. They don't want to lose out. They don't want to make the wrong decision. They don't want to make a mistake. Guarantees remove that. L.L. Bean is perhaps the, the grandfather of the powerful guarantee. All right? they, when they first started the company, they came out with their 100% satisfaction guarantee. And to this day, they stand behind it. So guarantees are very, very powerful. But you don't necessarily have to do a 100% satisfaction guarantee. There are other ways to use guarantees. For example, here's Nutrisystem. And they promise that you'll lose five pounds in one inch your first week, guaranteed or your money back. So they, they, they tie their guarantee to an outcome. If, if you don't lose the five pounds in one inch that first week, you get your money back. Or here, they're putting a time limit on the guarantee. It's not a you know an evergreen guarantee. It's 60 days, but they add in the words unconditional and money back, and that tempers the 60 days. So you have a 60-day unconditional money back guarantee. Our eyes go to that unconditional money back. That's what we focus on. So good ways to use guarantees. H is for herd mentality. What social scientists have found is when we're not sure what to do, we follow the lead of others, particularly others that are similar to us. The other name for this is social proof or social norming. But we basically do what other people do, particularly if we're not convinced of which course of action we should take. As a matter of fact, there were a couple of researchers in South Carolina, and they went out through this uh, uh, neighborhood, and they posed as solicitors for a fictitious charity. So what they would do is they would uh, walk up the front porch steps, ring the doorbell, somebody would come to the door, they would introduce themselves, they would describe the charity, and then they would ask the homeowner to make a donation. And what they found was when they asked the homeowner to make a donation, they would show the list of people who had already donated. And the longer that list was, the more likely the person in front of them would be to donate. Right? So put yourself in the shoes of the homeowner. You come to the door, two people that you don't know describe a charity you've never heard of. You couldn't because it was fictitious. It sounds like a good charity, but you know now you have to make that decision. And looks like a lot of people in the area have donated. Yeah, I guess I will too doesn't look like that many people have donated, yeah, maybe I won't either. So herd mentality is a very common decision-making shortcut. How do we use it in marketing? Well, look at what Staples does. They say customers like you bought these items. And our popular categories and services include these. So two hits of herd mentality there. We do what other people do. It's a very easy decision-making shortcut for us. Or here's Beyond the Rack. They're selling coach bags. There are three of them, but really there are only two because that one on the left is reserved by others. So just guess which one I want. I want the one everyone else has, right? That's herd mentality. But they tell me I can check back in 12 minutes. And if one becomes available in 12 minutes, I'll be able to get it too. So I'll have the one everyone else has. I is for information gap theory. And that's a phrase that was coined by George Lowenstein. He's a neuroeconomist. What he found was if there is a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you will take action to close the gap. If there's a gap between what you know and what you want to know, you'll take action to close that gap, to find out the information. A great way for marketers to tee up an information gap is to use the five W's and the one H. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. When you, when you start sentences, subject lines, headlines, content titles with who, what, where, when, why, and how. It, it tees up the idea that you know something that the other person doesn't know, and they're going to then take action to find out the answer. So here we have, who are the year's best loved brands? What's your MarTech IQ? Where's the birthplace of wine? When not to A-B test your mobile app? Why an online marketing suite is a game changer? And finally, how to give a killer presentation. So who, what, where, when, why, and how. Great words to use to tee up that information gap. You can also do things like the best, the worst, the most. These are all ways to get people to want to find out something. J is for jargon. Generally speaking, 
as writers, we want to avoid jargon. We don't want it to creep into our marketing. Sometimes, you know, writers think, oh, I'm going to use it. It's going to make me sound really intelligent and, and really, you know, uh, sophisticated. And honestly, what happens is it, it can make us sound pretentious. Uh, it can also confuse readers and it can, you know, turn readers off. We could literally run the risk of losing readers when they run into jargon because no one likes to be reminded that they don't know something. So my rule of thumb is don't use a 75 cent word when a 25 cent word will do. Right? Avoid jargon. Keep it simple. Keep it easy. Don't make people work too hard. Skip the 75 cent word when a 25 cent word will do. There are perhaps two notable exceptions to this rule. Two times when you might want to use that 75 cent word. One of them is when you might want to suggest more value. And the other is when you might want to imply insider status. So here we have something from a uh, dental uh, dental company, right? Uh, dentist office, and they're offering a savings certificate for tooth whitening. Now they could have called it a coupon, but the certificate just sounds a little bit, uh, you know, classier, a little bit more sophisticated. As a matter of fact, when I was a, a young copywriter, I did some work for American Express, and we could not use the word coupon. We only had to talk about certificates, savings certificates. So in this case. Both of the words are relatively easy to understand. Certificate is the 75 cent word versus the 25 cent word, but it's implying a certain amount of value. Here we have the can't miss CRO event of 2017. So if you're a insider, you understand what CRO means, click rate optimization. And so you, uh, you think, okay, these are gonna be my people. This is my tribe. I'm gonna be able to attend with like-minded individuals and I'm gonna learn the kinds of things I wanna learn. If this conference was looking to expand beyond where they normally market to pull in, you know, new Hey, Nancy, I think your mic might have cut out. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, good. Okay. Okay, I don't know what happened, and I apologize. Uh, All right. How far back do I need to go? Uh, you were only out for about 10 seconds, so okay. just turn to this slide Thank again. You. Yep. Thank you, Zach, and, and sorry, everybody. So, okay, uh, uh, so if you're trying to convey insider status, you use the acronym CRO. If you're trying to bring in people from outside your tribe, maybe you want to say conversion rate optimization. Spell it out. Okay, K, K is for knowledge. And what we have to remember is, is writers is when people read what we've written, they're going to read it through the lens of what they already know. They already have a certain amount of knowledge. It may be a lot, it may be a little, it may be erroneous, it may be correct, but they're going to look at things through, you know, through their own lens. That essentially, they're going to bring their own baggage. And we need to remember that. As a matter of fact, social scientists have a term for it. It's called availability bias. What they have found is people will judge the likelihood of an event happening based on how readily they can recall an example. So, for example, if you're someone who doesn't fly a lot or who never flies, you probably think it's far more dangerous to fly than it is. Why? Because the information that's available to you about flying is largely going to be through the media. And the media and the media does the media does not the media does not things. No. They report plane crashes, the fatalities, the casualties, that's what news is. That's the information that's available to you and it colors your perception. So how do we use this in marketing? Well, people are going to judge the likelihood of an event happening, and in this case, the event is they're going to need your product or service based on how readily they can recall an example. So first, before you ask them to buy, get them to think of a time in the past when your product or service would have come in handy, or imagine a time in the future when they could see themselves using it. Here we have the ADA insurance plans. They're trying to sell disability insurance to dentists. The problem is, when dentists are feeling healthy, they don't think they need disability insurance. So the ADA insurance plans use availability bias. They said, have you heard your colleagues complain about low back pain, carpal tunnel syndrome? You read that and you think, yeah, the last time I was at a, a professional meeting, Dr. Smith from across town, he wasn't there. Somebody said he was in bed with back pain. Hmm, it could happen to him, it could happen to me, right? Good use of availability bias. Well, here's the Boston Globe. And they're trying to get their subscribers to buy gift subscriptions. So they say, bostonglobe.com is an incredible gift for your 
And then they list 10 different descriptors, your avid reader, your political junkie, your sports fan. And as you read each of those, you slot in who you know that matches that description. My grandfather's an avid reader. My uncle's a political junkie. My daughter's a sports fan, and she's away at college. Hmm. Next thing you know, you've come up with 10 people that you think would enjoy a subscription to bostonglobe.com. L is for loss aversion. And what social scientists have found is people are twice as motivated to avoid pain as they are to achieve gain. Twice as motivated to avoid pain as they are to achieve gain. And this is a little counterintuitive to us as, as marketers and as marketing <coughs> writers because we're all about benefits, all about the wonderful things you're going to gain if you buy our product or service, if you do what we ask you to do. And I would never say that we should walk away from benefits. Benefits are good. But a little well-placed loss aversion will go a long way. Imagine you're in a casino. You're playing a slot machine. You win $100. On a scale of 1 to 10, maybe that's a 5. You know, it's not $1,000, it's $100. If you lost that same $100, it wouldn't be a negative 5. It would feel like a negative 10. We feel the losses twice as powerfully, therefore we're twice as motivated to avoid them. So how do we use that in marketing? Well, here's target marketing. They want you to subscribe to their uh, newsletter, and they say, don't miss your daily dose of marketing goodness. Those two little words, don't miss, are just enough to trigger loss aversion. They could have said, take advantage of your daily dose of, of marketing goodness. You know, Sign up for your daily dose of marketing goodness. You know, Make sure you, you get in on it. All of those would be more positive, but the don't miss is just enough to trigger that notion of loss aversion. Or here we have lot 18, and they do something very interesting. They say, you have $15 of unused credit in your account that will expire tomorrow at 1159. They're tapping into loss aversion coupled with the endowment effect. The endowment effect holds that uh, we place greater value on things that we own. If, if we already own something, if something is already ours, we value it more than if it's not. So. Instead of saying, we're going to give you a $15 discount if you order by tomorrow, Lot 18 said, we've put $15 of credit in your account, but it expires if you don't use it by tomorrow. So now it's already yours, and you're really going to lose it. You know, the you're going to feel the loss that much more powerfully if you don't end up using it. M is for mental energy. And the thing that we have to remember about mental energy is we want our readers to expend as little of it as possible. Okay, we don't want to make them work to understand what we're saying. We don't want to make them work to re respond or to reply, to do what we're asking them to do. We want people to use as little mental energy as possible. We want to make it easy cognitively, reduce the friction. My rule of thumb, and I'm sure many of you have heard it, is keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. Use, use simple language. Use clean layouts. Uh, minimize the number of steps. Chunk out the information. Keep it very simple. So here are a few little rules. Uh, I'm sorry, I hear a few examples. Uh, one is from copy hackers, and they tested for one of their um, fashion clients two different buttons because they were trying to get people to subscribe to an e-newsletter. So the first button said, sign up now. The second button said, show me outfits I love. The first button, while it was clear and direct, did not perform as well as the second button. In fact, show me outfits I love beat it by 123.9%. That's how much of an increase they got. Why? Because they, they made it a no-brainer in terms of what the benefit was. If I hit this button, I'm going to see outfits that I love. That's what this e-newsletter is going to be all about. They put the benefit right on the button copy. They made it a no-brainer. They made it really easy. Here's another example. This is from AdLucent, and they do some work with a, uh, a pet supply company. And they had a well, landing page that was doing pretty well, but they decided to take another look at it and clean it up remove anything that was extraneous, any extraneous copy. They, they looked at it. They took away things that, that weren't needed. They examined each word, made sure it was working hard. They got a 233% better conversion rate. So keep it simple, stupid, or keep it simple and short could be the other way to say that. Okay, N is for the word new. And humans are hardwired to seek out the new and the novel. Why? Because as we find it, it activates the pleasure center in our brains. And when that happens, dopamine gets released, and that feels good. So we're constantly looking for the next new thing. So what does that mean to us as writers? Well, it means that we want to leverage news. When we have news, we want to leverage that news. We, and we want to use the word new. And in fact, the entire family of new words, there's new, now, introducing, announcing, finally, soon. These are all words that signal to the human brain that there's something new on the horizon. So we want to use them, and we want to use them up front, use them at the beginnings uh, or at the ends of 
um, of our headlines and our subject lines because people notice the beginning and the end, uh, recency and um, uh, primacy and, and recency. They, they notice the beginning and the end most often. So make those words work for you. Here we have new warming trends, now accepting nominations, introducing staples, announcing our spring, finally you get uh, on tour soon. And if you're looking for a verb to use, the word discover is another word that signals to the human brain that there's something new on the horizon. So these are all great words to use. O is for overcoming objections. The thing that we have to remember is when we put our, our marketing message out there, some people are going to be so psyched and, and they're going to respond right away. But there's going to be a lot of other people that have a certain amount of hesitation. They're not going to be quite sure. They're going to be, there's going to be something, some barrier some hesitancy and it's our job as writers to identify what it is and use it to turn them around we have to figure out what it is people are going to be hesitant about we need to acknowledge it and we need to build into our copy the argument that overcomes it another way to look at it is we need to take lemons and turn them into lemonade there's always going to be some buying barrier and we can't just ignore it because it's not going to go away so we need to acknowledge it point marketing checklist which sounds great but for some people they might say oh Denny Hatch yeah I know him he's a he's a phenomenal direct mail guy but I don't really do a lot of direct mail so look at what they do they say no matter if your message is running in email or direct mail online or, or offline you know this is the book for you they they kind of get you they acknowledge what you're thinking and they turn it around or maybe you're about to get somebody to order and what happens you know people are just I don't know I don't know if I make that commitment you know here we have select a membership you know one month three months six months 12 months oh that's the best choice but I don't know if I want to be locked in so what do they say right under select a membership cancel anytime okay they remove that buying barrier I'm not gonna get locked in I'm not gonna find myself in a position where I can't get out where I'm unhappy you know I still have that control P is for personalization and uh, Personalization works. We know this in marketing, and, and the reason why is we all love our names. Social scientists talk about something known as the principle of liking, and it basically suggests that we place more value on things that remind us of ourselves, and what reminds us of ourselves more than our names, right? Names are, are substitutes for ourselves, and so uh, using personalization works very, very well. As a matter of fact, there was a study done, and that study found that you are more likely to donate to a hurricane relief fund if the first letter of the hurricane matches the uh, the first letter of the hurricane's name matches the first letter of your name so I think if I had said to you like why would you donate to a hurricane you would have um, the hurricane relief fund you would have all kinds of, of really good reasons but the first letter of the hurricane's name matching the first letter of your name probably isn't one of the ones that you would have come up with so it'll be interesting to see I have, I have a good friend Gert it'll be interesting to see if, if hurricane Gert has a relief fund going if my friend Gert donates but it, it is, the data doesn't lie, and uh, that is the case. You are actually also 12% more likely to marry somebody whose first name begins with the same first letter as yours. And you're more likely to comply with a request from someone who shares your same first name or a name similar to yours. So it's amazing uh, the power of, of names and of personalization. As a matter of fact, Experian found that you can get a 29.3% increase in your opening rates if a subject line has the person's name in it and I would say don't stop at the subject line you know use personalization on the subject line use it in the body of, of, of uh, an email use it in the visuals personalization can be very very powerful and it's not just somebody's name look at this landing page uh, they say I'm determined to make a business in Newtonville successful well I live in Newtonville wow okay that speaks to me it's relevant it's personalized not by my name but by some other demographic information that's meaningful to me Okay, Q is for questions. Questions are wonderful uh, devices for writers. Questions are wonderful devices for writers because they involve people. Questions can be very involving. In fact, um, World Data found a question subject line is good for an 11% increase in opening rates. Questions are good because they involve people. As a matter of fact, the BI Norwegian School of Business found that questions outperform declarative sentences by 140 to 150%, 140 to 150% lift on a question versus a declarative sentence. So just a quick refresher back in English class, a declarative sentence would be something like, um, wine may improve your memory. 
Wine may improve your memory is a declarative version. The question version would be, does wine improve your memory? Can wine improve your memory? But questions pull people in. They, uh, they, they, they just invite engagement. And there are a couple of things to keep in mind with questions. One is, don't phrase your question in a way that can get a simple yes or no answer. Look at what Heinz Marketing does here. They say, scale one to five. How bad do your sales presentations suck? You know, they didn't just say, do your sales presentations suck? Because then you either answer yes or no. And if you say no, they've lost you. But posing the question so that it's, it requires something other than a yes or no answer is a very good thing. The other great thing that questions can be used for is to tread into uh, tough territory. So for example, here we have something from Vanguard and they pose the question, how many people have opened a retirement account by your age? The thing is, most of us either don't have a retirement account or don't have enough money in the retirement account. But who wants to hear that? Nobody, right? So Vanguard doesn't lead with that. No, they kind of slip in cautiously with a question. They invite you in. How many people have opened a retirement account by your age? Oh, I don't know. Let me see. And that allows them to then continue the conversation, continue the dialogue, and, and get to the information that they want to get to, which is, hey, you probably need to save more and we can help you. So questions can be very, very powerful devices for us. R is for rational and emotional. And what we need to keep in mind as uh, writers is that people make decisions for emotional reasons and then we later justify them to ourselves and to others with rational reasons. So that means that as writers we need to provide both the rational and the emotional cell. We need to have both sides of the argument and this holds true whether you're in a B2B environment or a B2C environment. Both of them, uh, it, no matter what, people are people and they're making decisions for emotional reasons and then justifying them later to themselves and others with the rational reasons. As a matter of fact, there's a researcher by the name of Antonio Damasio, and uh, he performed some research using people who had sustained injury to the part of their brain that controlled emotion. And what he found was these people were virtually incapable of making a decision. Even a decision as simple as uh, what to have for lunch that day, they were virtually incapable of making a decision. So we need the, the rational and the emotional. So in marketing, what that means is, you know, inject some of that emotion. Here we have BMW. They say, drive a brand new BMW to the beach or your next barbecue for only two thirty seven a month. So, you know, the, the price is ultimately going to determine whether or not you can afford it. But the first thing you want to do is you want to start thinking about yourself cruising up to the beach in that brand new BMW and, and just the emotion around that. And then when you tell people that you bought a BMW, you're going to say, well, I got a great deal. It's only two thirty seven, you know. Um, or here we have a presentation skills training seminar, an ad for that, and they say develop effective presentation skills and become the presenter everyone listens to. There's the emotion there. They're not talking about, you know, develop uh, effective presentation skills so that you can uh, more, more accurately convey information or more quickly convey information. Sure, all of that's in there and we'll get to it, right? But the, the emotion is the, present, uh, the presenter everyone listens to. Nail your next presentation. S is for storytelling, and if you're in marketing, I'm sure that you've heard about the power of storytelling. It's become something of a buzzword these days, and, uh, and the truth of the matter is, storytelling works. Back before the written word, stories were how information was passed from, from person to person, generation to generation, uh, tribe to tribe. Storytelling can be very, very effective, and in fact, science offers a, a very real reason, a very good explanation as to why storytelling is so effective, and that is if we were just dealing with facts today, facts and figures, bullet points on a screen, it would involve two areas of your brain, right? Broca's area and Wernicke's area. They're the two areas that process language. However, when you hear or read a story, other parts of your brain get, uh, get activated. If, if I told you that uh, when, when Zach and I were rehearsing this presentation, he ran into the room and smacked me in the head, that would act, he would never do that, of course, but that would activate the motor cortex in your brain, the running, the slapping. If I told you that I, I got up this morning and I smelled the aroma of fresh brewed coffee, that would activate the olfactory cortex in your brain. And the net net is the more parts of your brain that get activated, the better you understand the information and the longer you retain it. And that's why for, for marketing writing, it's so important to use stories because we want people to better understand what we're saying. We want them to remember it, to retain it. For example, if you went to JetBlue, you would have a choice of four different uh, customer stories here. And if you chose the one on the left there, the one from uh, Ariana, you would find out that she travels a lot. She's six foot three inches tall, and it is brutal for her to fold herself into that small airplane seat with her knees jammed up against the the uh, the table on the seat back in front of her. And cross country flights are just you know nightmares. And she tells you the story, and then she tells you she 
loves the fact that JetBlue just introduced uh, more legroom. And when you hear her tell that story, you remember it so much better than if you just gone to the JetBlue website and there was a bullet point that said, we now have extra legroom. The other thing you should know about stories is stories have been proven to add value to a product or a service. There were a couple of uh, journalists who became researchers and they started something called the Significant Objects Project. What they did is they ran around to flea markets, yard sales, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, liquidation sales. They, they basically bought up the junk that no one else wanted. And then they hired writers to write stories about these objects. And then they posted the object and the story on eBay. And they were very upfront about the fact that the story was not meant to be factual. It was, in fact, a story. And then they watched as these products, and not these products, these items, sold. For example, this is a Utah snow globe. They bought it at a, at a tag sale, a yard sale, for 99 cents. They sold it for $59. Just an incredible return on their investment. They, they didn't do it for the profit. They donated the profits to charity. They did it to prove the power of stories, the power that stories have to add value. And as marketers, we need to keep that in mind because stories can add value to our company, to our product, to our service. T is for time. And what we need to remember is, as writers, we will spend far more time writing than people will spend reading. Okay, people skim and scam, they uh, skim and scan, they try to, uh, to multitask, they get distracted, so they're just not spending a lot of time with what we've written. As a matter of fact, people, people read about 25% slower online, and according to the Nielsen Norman Group, the average web page, only 28% of the words actually get read. On the average web page, only 28% of the words actually get read. So as writers, we have to keep this in mind. We, we have to really remember how it is people are going to be consuming what we've written. They're not going to be uh, reading it the way we've written it. So don't bury the lead. If you have something important to say, say it right up front. Don't make people wait two, three paragraphs to get to it. You know, Say it right up front. Make sure that, that people get that. Be clear and concise. Don't go on and on and on. Concise is good. Clarity will trump cleverness. Don't try to be too cute and clever at the expense of being clear because people want the clarity. And then use bold, subheads, bullets, lists. If you can organize your copy that way, it makes it that much easier to absorb because, again, people are skimming and scanning. U is for urgency. And urgency is one half of the scarcity principle. What social scientists have found is if something's readily available, we may or may not be interested. We're interested, we, we take advantage of it. However, if you let somebody know that that something is only going to be available for a limited time, or it's only available in limited quantities, that changes everything. That makes us want it and want it badly. In fact, it can even make us want something that we ordinarily wouldn't have wanted. Back in 2012, uh, Hostess decided to discontinue Twinkies, right? They just weren't selling. So they announced they were going to discontinue them. Suddenly, everybody had to have Twinkies. There was a box, a single box of Twinkies on sale at eBay. Uh, the starting bid was $200,000. It, it's amazing. When the Concord announced that they were going to stop flying because not enough people were buying tickets, they ended up selling out every last remaining ticket. So if you can't have something, it makes you want it. So how do we use it in marketing? Well, here's Expedia. Only seven tickets left at this price. It doesn't mean that you can't get the same ticket, but at a different price. But if you want this price, there's only seven left. And when we find out that there's a limited quantity, it prompts us to act. Or here's Neil Patel. He says, for just a very limited time, you can enroll in my uh, marketing program. So if you have a deadline, if you have an expiration date, wonderful. Make sure you use it. Make sure you pop it. But sometimes in marketing, we don't have expiration dates. We have more evergreen offers, but we want to imply some kind of urgency. So we say, you know, for a limited time, uh, you know, offer won't always be around. Can't guarantee it'll be repeated. We, we, uh, we suggest urgency. Or maybe we have deadlines, but it's, um, it's the kind of thing where they're rolling. So maybe we say today only or expire soon. But we want to use words and phrases that suggest this isn't just here for whenever you happen to want to wander over and take advantage of it. We want to get some of that urgency in there. V is for the von Restorff effect. And what social scientists have found is people will notice and remember things that stand out. This goes way back to our caveman days when if something was out of place, if it was, you know, if something was where it shouldn't be or if something was missing, we should notice it because it could pose a real threat. If we notice something on the horizon that wasn't there yesterday, that something could possibly eat us back in our caveman days. All these years later, we're still hardwired to notice things that are different, things that stand out. 
So here, you look at this ad and your eye immediately goes to the smile, uh, not only because he's smiling, but mostly because that tooth is missing. There's something that's not there that should be there. We notice things that are different, that stand out. And so we should use that in our marketing. Here's two quick email examples. Emojis these days are doing very, very well. World Data finds you can get a 31 to a 34% lift in your email opens if your subject line has an emoji. But that is going to change the more often people use emojis. If every one of these emails, or even if most of these email subject lines had emojis, they kind of cancel each other out in terms of effectiveness. But right now there's only one, so your eye goes to that red heart. Or have you ever gotten the oops, I'm sorry email, oops, we made a mistake? Right now they're getting a 47% opening rate because it's different. It's not like the regular email. This is someone going, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. These are the digital equivalent of rubbernecking on the highway. When you're, we're driving on the highway and we have to slow down and look at the accident in the other lane, you might have gotten the original email, not even bothered to open it. You get the oops email, you open it. You want to know what, what was the accident, who screwed up, what was the mistake, what did they send that they shouldn't have sent. You know, it's, it's just human nature. But right now they're getting a 47% opening rate. All right, W is for wordplay. And uh, there are certain literary devices, certain turns of phrase, certain figures of speech that you as a writer have available to you that will either help attract people's attention, help you more accurately convey the information, or uh, help people remember and respond to it. And so you want to use these, okay? We want to use these, these turns of phrase and these figures of speech. Three of them are rhyme, simile, and surprise. And I want to give you a quick example and a quick explanation for each of these, because they can be very powerful in the hands of a writer. There's something known as rhyme is reason bias. What social scientists have found is that you can have two sentences, they both say the same thing, one of them rhymes, the other one doesn't. People will judge the rhyming phrase, the rhyming sentence, to be the more truthful, more accurate. Why? Because rhymes are easier to process. If they're easier for the brain to process, they feel more right. And if it feels right, it must be true. So think of uh, the O.J. Simpson trial, right? If the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. The power of rhymes, we believe them. We, we think that they're more truthful and more accurate. Similes are really great devices for writers to take something that's more abstract and make it more concrete, or to take something that's a little bit harder to understand, maybe a new product or a more difficult concept, and make it more con concrete, make it easier to understand. So similes involve the use of the word like or the use of the word as. So here we have crazy egg is like a pair of x-ray glasses. Well, I don't know what crazy egg is, but oh, I understand x-ray glasses. So it's like a pair of x-ray glasses uh, to see what people are doing on my website. Oh, okay, now I understand. So taking the, you know, the more abstract, more difficult to understand and, and making it more accessible, making it more concrete. And finally, surprise is a fabulous uh, literary device for a writer to use. Researchers at University College in London found that the human brain is hardwired to predict what comes next. So look at that subject line. It says, dress to chill. Well, as we're reading that, we read dress to, and our brain immediately fills in kill, because that's the, the turn of phrase, right? Dress to kill. So what happens is we read dress to chill, but we also think dress to kill. So this subject line provides a twofer. We come away with the idea that these clothes are going to be great to chill in, to relax in on the weekends, but you're going to look great. You're going to look killer in them. You get that one-two punch, because the brain is predicting what comes next, and then it gets surprised when it reads what's actually there. X is for the X factor. And for those of you who are hanging in there wondering, what is she going to come up with for X? In this particular context, since we're talking about copying words, the X factor is actually visuals, because visuals are going to help us as, uh, as writers. In fact, 90% of the information that's transmitted to the brain is visual. We have an easier time processing pictures than we do words, because words came along much later. So pictures can help us as writers convey our information, get it better remembered, and actually make people believe it more. In fact, there are a couple of things you can do with visuals. In this first instance, what you can do is you can direct attention with them, because people are hardwired to follow eye gaze. We are hardwired to follow the eye gaze of another person. So here the woman is looking at the form field, and that's exactly where chemistry.com wants you to look. They want you to fill it in. If she were looking down, she would direct your eyes you know, down to the bottom of the screen and off. If she were looking off in the opposite direction, maybe she would direct your eyes to the, to the uh, quote, which is good. I mean, she would definitely direct your eyes to the quote. I shouldn't say maybe. Um, and that's good, but where they really want you is focused on that form field. That's what they want you to fill out. So you can use eye gaze to focus people where you want them to look. The other helpful visual that you should know about is charts and graphs, the power of charts and graphs. Cornell University ran a study. They asked people to read uh, some copy about a new drug that was coming out. And then they asked people, do you believe what you read? 67% said yes. 
Then they had people read the same copy, but they added a graph. And then 97% said yes, they believed it. And the researchers found it wasn't that the graph added additional information. It wasn't that the graph made the information that was read uh, easier to understand. It was that it signaled scientific veracity, truthfulness, credibility. You know, I don't know what the graph of the chart says, but it's there. And the mere presence makes it seem more legit. I would never suggest that you make up charts and graphs. You don't want to do that as a marketer. But many times, our copy does lend itself to a chart or graph. Use it because it just automatically conveys, ah, oh, this, is, this is credible. This is, this is the real deal. Why is for the word you, and you is a powerful word. We talked about the principle of liking. Um, if you can use somebody's name, you use somebody's name. If you can't use the word you, it's a good substitute. It, it's widely considered one of the top uh, uh, persuasive words in the English language. If somebody asked me to, to choose one word to start every marketing piece I wrote, it might very well be the word you. Why? Because people are interested what's in, you know, in what's in it for them, with them, what's in it for me. As marketers, we have a lot of information we want to convey, but the most important information we can convey is the information that people are seeking. They want to know not about our product, they want to know how our product or our service benefits them. So keep in mind what's in it for me. Here we have something from Neighborhood Health Plan. Every one of those uh, bullets starts with either you or you and your employees. Now they could have started with we or our or our plan or United or, or Neighborhood Health Plan, but instead they started with you and your employees because that pulls the eye in. Now compare that to this subject line. We've never looked better. Well, if I'm going to go to Banana Republic, it's going to be so I can look better, not so they can look better. When we see the word we, we kind of gloss right over it. We don't really pay attention. When we see the word you, it pulls us in. It's a substitute for ourselves, and we're more interested in ourselves than anybody else. And finally, we're, we're at Z. And Z is for the Zygarnik effect. And what social scientists have found is human beings are hardwired to finish what they've started. We're hardwired to finish what we've started. And if we start something we don't finish it, we kind of get this nagging feeling, this compulsion to, to finish up. It's why cliffhangers in the media do so well. You know, anyone who's watching the House of Cards or Game of Thrones, you know, the episodes ended and we couldn't wait for the next ones to come out. We absolutely could not wait for them to come out. We want to know how it's going to end, you know, what's going to happen next. As marketers, we can use that. Here, Snapfish sends a, an email out and they say, hey, are you ready to finish your photo card? You're almost done. You started it, but you didn't quite finish it. Something, you know, took you away. Come on back, finish it. They remind you. Now you've got this nagging feeling that you should really go and finish it. Or finally, if you've ever decided that you wanted to do a customer loyalty program, uh, whether it's online or offline, you know, you have one of those punch cards. And basically you say, if you make nine purchases, you'll get your tenth for free. So you can give somebody a punch card with nine blank boxes, or you can give them a punch card with ten boxes. The first one is checked off, and then it's followed by nine blank boxes. So in both cases, you have to make nine purchases. Researchers at Wharton and University of Southern California found that people are 79% more likely to finish if the first box has already been checked. So we have gone through 26 different uh, words, phrases, copy constructs that you can use that will instantly make you more persuasive. If anybody wants a free cheat sheet that recaps them, because we went kind of quickly, I know, just get in touch with me. I'd be happy to send you the PDF. It recaps all of them. And um, that's about it for me. Zach, I'm going to turn it back over to you if there are questions. Yeah, Nancy, uh, yeah, thank Nancy, you yeah, so thank much. You that so was much. a great, was a great uh, presentation. Uh, I, I know it's really valuable for me since someone who sends emails and writes landing page copy. Uh, but we uh, are kind of running late on time, so I'm going to try to get through these questions quick. Uh, first one is, with copy, how do you judge how much text it to provide in different applications such as emails, websites, brochures, postcards, in an attempt to avoid too much or too little information? Uh, that's, a, that's a great answer. And um, I think you, you need to look at a few different things. And you also probably want to test, because that's going to give you the, the best answer for your particular situation, your particular audience. But, but uh, one thing to keep in mind is if you're trying to sell off the page, you need more copy, because you're asking people to make a, a, a buying decision. If you're only trying to generate leads, I shouldn't say only trying, because that's difficult enough. But if you're trying to generate leads, you can get away with less copy. If you're trying to sell off the page, you need more copy. Then you need to look at the um, the channel that you're in. Obviously social uh, you know, is going to be much more uh, restrictive than uh, a six-page brochure. But um, my rule of thumb is use as, as few words as possible to convey the information that you need to convey. So go as long as you need to to convey the information that you need to convey, but make sure that your copy is crisp, that it's compelling, and that it's succinct. 
And then, you know, what I would suggest is, is start to test, you know, test a shorter email versus a longer email, uh, you know, a longer copy ad versus a shorter copy ad, and start to get a feel for where your sweet spot is for your product and for your audience. Okay, next question. How do you work with clients who won't let you keep it simple, stupid, uh, and they love their industry jargon? Uh, yeah, I, and you know that that does happen. That, that's a that's a very real question. And, and so you try to, I think, to move them in increments. You know, so you're not going to go from, you know, complicated jargon laden uh, copy all the way quickly to jargon free simple copy. It's just not going to be a, a quick uh, progression. But you do it in increments and. I'm a big fan of testing, and if you can test and prove that you're getting a better response from the the simpler copy, it's kind of hard to argue against it. If you don't have the opportunity to test, I know you know we, we all love to, but sometimes we don't have the opportunity. There are studies out there, and one of the things that you can do is you can introduce some of these studies to the client, and so then it's not you and what could be perceived as your personal preference. It's a study that you're citing that came from Stanford or from Harvard or from uh, you know an, another marketer, but uh, you know they ran the study and what they found was more complicated term, less complicated term, less complicated term actually outperformed the more complicated one in the marketplace. Maybe we should give it a try, you know, and, and it becomes a uh, a third party expert that you're quoting and uh, a matter of dollars and cents, you know, the impact of of um, easier to read copy. That those are a couple of ways that I would suggest trying to uh, nudge them along that uh, keep it short and simple route. And I think if you're talking to a client who doesn't want to budge, I would say short and simple, not simple stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, we have we're kind of short on time. We got two more. We're going to get through really fast. Uh, with of the 26 choices, how do you determine which is best for your product? Ah. Uh, that is a wonderful question, and there there is no easy answer. Uh, I mean, you really need to understand these and, um, and 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 what their power is. But but basically, there's there's a process that you can go through, and, and it would start with discovery, where you're really uh, digging into your your prospects and your customers, and figuring out their buying barriers, and figuring out their mindsets, and uh, you know what their inclinations are, and what their hesitancies are, and then you start to do a, like a, a review of the of the inventory of human behavior triggers that are out there, because uh, there are more than the 26 we just talked about actually, and uh, you start to figure out uh, you know which are going to be the likely going to be the best ones to uh, to apply in this particular situation. And then you you know you create your hypothesis, and then you do a limited test to see if the hypothesis is actually being borne out. And then you began to take that information and continually optimize. So it's um it's it, there there is a way to do it. Unfortunately, I don't have a really quick answer that says oh you know use A and G <laughs> that that you know it it really is very um, uh, scenario specific. Okay. Um... We might have time for two more. Uh, okay, this one's from Joel. Uh, with loss aversion, how do you mitigate sounding like you're using scare tactics? Good question, Joel. Uh, I think the one thing we have to always keep in mind is, as marketers, we have a, a sacred relationship with our customers and our prospects, and we don't want to do anything that's going to damage that relationship. So if, if we're saying that uh, you know something is limited or that time is limited, or we want to actually pay that off and, and we you know we want to you know we don't want to be saying time is limited and say that 52 weeks a year because that's just not right uh, you know so if we have an expiration date we should we should live by it and then we rest things for a while and then we introduce another expiration date uh, if, if it's going to be one of those evergreen offers like I talked about um, you know we say something like you know please respond by or you know, we would love to hear, hear from you by, so we're not suggesting that um, you're not going to be able to get it if, if you, you know, don't reply uh, later, but we're, we're making people feel that now is a good time to reply. Uh, you know, the thing to keep in mind with, um, with a lot of these is, as I said earlier, it's decision-making shortcuts because people aren't really sitting there with their rational hat on and examining each word and thinking about the pros and cons and the cost you know, benefit analysis. Uh, they are responding instinctively, automatically. So, you know, suggesting, you know, please respond by uh, the end of this week. It doesn't say that they can't respond at another time, but when they see, when, when they see, please respond by the end of this week, they have a tendency to, to do it. So, I think it's, it's a very good question. You don't want to abuse the relationship you have, but you also want to use some of these 
automatic behaviors that people are prone to exhibit. Okay, and the last one from Alex is, are there more taboo words besides price-related ones? Oh, are there more taboo words? Um, huh. So, uh, besides the ones that are related to price. So, I think that, um, yes, that, that there are, you know, and some of them are simple, like, uh, you know, on, on your landing pages and websites, submit is, you know, it gets the job done, but really there are so many other words that are that are better uh, that express more of a benefit. So you know that would that would be one of them. Um, I think in in uh, certain industries and certain verticals and categories, there are going to be you know vertical and category specific words that you that you want to avoid. Um, I, I, and off, off the top of my head, I'm 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 running out of examples. Of, no, that's of that's fine. That, all right. Well, Nancy, thank you again for for taking time, you know, and, and answering these questions, and then of course your presentation. Uh, thanks for everyone else for joining the webinar. Um, we will be back next month in September with Larry Kim, and he will be presenting a webinar on conversion rate optimization, and we'll we will have registration open for that uh, pretty soon. Uh, I'm Zach from Vertical Measures, and we'd like to thank you all for attending, and have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you.